India stands as one of the world's fastest-growing major economies. This growth trajectory, along with a largely unbanked rural population, presents a golden opportunity for banking investments. The Indian middle class, growing in numbers, is demanding more sophisticated banking services from digital wallets to personalized loans. These problems have given the rise to government initiatives, entrepreneurs, and even foreign investments. For instance, the government pushed out the Jandan Yujanan, which aims to provide every household access to banking services. This instilled a government-backed confidence in the untapped financial market. Then there's the technological wave. India's tech-savvy youth population is pushing banks to innovate, leading to the rise of digital payments, online banking, and fintech solutions. All of these issues and opportunities have led foreign investors around the world to want a piece of India's banking system. From the western parts of the world such as the United States and Europe to the eastern giants such as Singapore and Japan have been pouring billions of dollars into India's economy all for the purpose of participating in the rising financial field of the country. This leads us to the question of today's video, just how important has India's financial industry become to the world markets? Who are the largest investors and what is the impact to India's economy? To begin, let us dive deep into the key players and their investments. The first and one of the most important investors to India has always been Japan. Japan, through its many conglomerates, have either been acquiring Indian companies or even opening up their own branches to the country. The first company, known as Sumitomo Mitsui Financial Group, or SMFG for short, has acquired a 75% stake in a company called Fullerton India for 2 billion US dollars. Fullerton India, which eventually was renamed to SMFG India Credit, caters to over 2.6 million customers, with a network of over 729 branches spread across 65,000 villages, is arguably not just any small financial company. This acquisition represents one of the blockbuster deals for a Japanese company to enter India's financial market. Secondly, Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, or MUFG, which is a megabank of Japan, has also acquired a stake at DMI Finance worth 19.1 billion Indian rupees, which is about 250 million US dollars. Like Fullerton India, DMI Finance has been one of the most active digital finance players in India and has an accessible customer base of 25 million, which is expected to grow to 40 million by the 2024 financial year. Further, some Japanese subsidiaries in India also have stakes in banks. The Nippon Life India Asset Management, for instance, holds a 1.2% stake in Bank Baroda, worth 12.2 billion rupees, and nearly a 1% stake in Canara Bank, worth 6.9 billion rupees, and another stake worth 1.7 billion rupees in the Union Bank of India. Now, let's not get into too many details for Japanese investments because there are more than just this country. Singapore, also a juggernaut, has been actively investing in India as well. Some of the most famous details obviously come from Singapore's sovereign wealth funds and its big banking companies. Temesic Holdings, a sovereign fund of Singapore, has actively invested and bought shares of Indian banking companies over the years. They backed Indian Neobank in a 100 million funding with other co-investors to buy a big stock share with other investors along with GIC, the other sovereign fund in Badan Bank for $1.94 billion. According to its latest portfolio, it also holds shares in HDFC Bank Limited and ICICI Bank Limited, two big banks in India. Singapore's banking giant's point of view, which includes DBS, OCBC, and UOB, has also been active investors. DBS Bank, for instance, has taken over a troubled bank known as Lakshmi Villas Bank, which is a 94-year-old Chennai-based private bank. When it completed the takeover, the bank had 4,000 employees. Surprisingly, of all stories, even China, despite geopolitical tensions, haven't shied away either. 
According to several reports, China's central bank has even acquired a 1% stake in India's HDFC. Although it is just a tiny amount, it is still important to know that China is still investing in Indian banks, despite having problems with politics. From the West, the United States is arguably the most important. U.S. companies have been actively pursuing stakes in both financial startups and decade-long traditional banking companies. For starters, U.S. big companies and even private equity have joined investment rounds for Indian digital finance startups such as A Finance, PayTM, PhonePay, Cred, Pine Labs, and in all honesty, a very, very long list. You see, American companies, especially fund managers and private equity investors, have been pouring billions of dollars towards India's fintech industry. They have been part of the fuel in why India's fintech companies have risen in value. Now, let us move to the Middle East, the home of big money. One of the latest stories in 2023 was when the Emirates NBD emerged as one of the frontrunners to buy majority stakes in India's IDBI Bank. According to reports, Emirates NBD and Canada's Fairfax Group have submitted their expression of interest to buy a 60.7% majority stake that is being offered by the Government of India and Life Insurance Corporation of India. Although, as far as we are concerned, the sale has still not been made. In Switzerland, there are also reports of Zurich Insurance buying a 51% stake in Kotak General for $487 million. Kotak Mahindra General Insurance offers non-life insurances such as health, home motors, and others. Now, these are just a summary of the many investments out there. There are a lot of investors that are in the process, or even in the future, that may pour money into India's banking system. But you already get it. One of the next questions that people often ask is, what is the actual impact to India's economy? This is arguably the most important part to discuss. Why does foreign investment even matter if, say, domestic investors can do the job? Well, to answer that, we need to start with the influx of foreign capital, which is the immediate impact that is evident. Also known as an increased liquidity, influx of foreign capital can mean that banks now have more funds at their disposal, translating to more loans and credit facilities for businesses and individuals alike. Secondly, the introduction of international best practices can elevate the standards of operations within these banks. Banks like Sumitomo Mitsui or MUFG Bank bring with them a legacy of stringent operational standards, risk management practices, and innovative customer solutions. When these practices get integrated into Indian banks, it results in a more robust, efficient, and customer-centric banking experience. Competition is also a benefit. With major international players stepping into the arena, competition among banks will intensify. This is good news for customers. Intense competition often results in better interest rates, innovative banking products, and improved customer services. But then, of course, with every known benefit, there will always be downsides. First, with massive foreign investments comes the risk of too much dependence on international entities. This can make the Indian banking sector susceptible to global economic fluctuations. If there's an economic downturn in a country that has heavily invested in India, it might influence the operations of their banking subsidiaries or associates in India. Secondly, the entry of these foreign banks and the capital they bring can put pressure on local Indian banks especially the smaller ones. They might find it challenging to compete with the vast resources and technological prowess of international entities. Thirdly, and most importantly, foreign investors are always known to invest for profit. Or to put it simply, when they put billions of dollars worth of money into India, they are expecting to generate money from these investments, which may go back to Japan, Singapore, or the US. These generated profits don't stay in India. It can be redirected to, say, China, Vietnam, or Indonesia. So in the end, what needs to be done is a balance. India's government must understand that too much foreign investments may be bad for the economy, but too little can be a missed opportunity. But anyway, do let us know what you think. Thanks for watching.